Um, Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam President. Just a few comments that I would like to make tonight. We've heard a lot of discussion today. We've heard a lot of amendments. But at the end of the day, it's, it's uh, a good question to ask us, indeed, what have these amendments achieved? And the reality of it is it's probably very little because I think the main points that are of concern in this overall bill have not been, have not been addressed in a meaningful way. Whether we're talking about the idea of competition, whether we're talking about the idea of accountability, we never even began to talk about, in, in many respects, to the issue that Senator Brown brought, brought up about the navigators, the fact that we're going to have unlicensed people helping, helping, our, helping the customers and the, the people who are in need of insurance work their way through this system. Many of us had our businesses, we are, hold state licenses. In my case, it's real estate. In some of my colleagues' cases, it's insurance. We have to be very careful that the people that we have in our offices that are unlicensed do not go out of their way and do not give too much information or assume any type of role of advisory capacity. And yet we're asking people who are in need of, of services as they pursue uh, health insurance to rely on people that are unlicensed and regardless of the amount of training they have, will not have a full comprehension of the insurance system. I think that it is a disservice to those people that are in need of their services, to have people that are unlicensed and, capable, and in many cases not fully understanding the insurance system. We've talked about the, um, the fiscal notes, and the reality of it is, is that there was an admission made, that there really was no discussion of the cost at the local level, and yet there are many local governments that do believe they will have a cost, whether it's with additional personnel programs and that type of thing. I think in reality, we have to recognize that we're stressed, we're meeting a deadline as far as the federal government is concerned. But what we have done here is in truly a disservice to the people of the state of Minnesota. We have taken a system that had a broader window that would allow more programs into, into play for our co uh, consumers, and we have, we have narrowed that window. We are going to have a system that picks the winners and the losers within the insurance business. It is unfair to our consumers, it is unfair to the insurance industry, and then quite frankly, in my opinion, it is the beginning of the end of one of the greatest health care systems that has been developed in this country. We have many great providers of both insurance products and health services in this state, and I think that this bill does a disservice to them and to the consumers who are in need of those services. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Madam President. Members, we've had quite a discussion here tonight about one of the most important uh, parts of our economy, which is health care. And we know, we all agree on this, I believe, Minnesota is a leader in health care. We're known as a state with highest quality, lowest cost, and best outcomes. So we should have a Minnesota-made health insurance exchange. It should be a Minnesota-made exchange. That's what I wanted to see today. We should have a Minnesota-made insurance exchange that retains patient choice in health care, one that encourages competition among health insurance plans, and one that is governed by a board that includes the experience necessary to establish those sound policies relating to providers and insurance carriers. But sadly, members, the bill before us tonight does not do that. The bill before us tonight limits patient choice. The bill before you tonight increases cost. The bill we'll be voting on tonight limits competition among health plans. And the bill that we will be voting on tonight is governed by a board that is void of the expertise in the science of the health care delivery and actuarial science. Members, in its current form, this is a dose of bad medicine. For the sake of Minnesotans, I'm hopeful, very hopeful, that this bill will come back in better form when we see it after conference committee. Minnesotans deserve better. Vote red. Senator Benson. Thank you, Madam President. Um, as Senator Nelson said, 
This bill does fundamentally transform Minnesota's health care system. And we do have the best health care system in the world, and it's our responsibility to protect Minnesota's health care and Minnesota's citizens. And so as you prepare to vote for this bill, make sure that you can answer these questions. How much will this cost us? Will my constituents get to keep their doctors? Is my privacy going to be protected in this exchange? Now we've talked about the costs, and I sent around yet another article about the cost of care in Massachusetts. They're a little bit of ahead, ahead of us, and they're running into big trouble. The board can choose the plans it deems fit, might not have your doctor, which means you either leave your doctor or you leave the exchange. And privacy. There are still serious concerns about the amount of data flowing back and forth between entities and the federal government. So after all this debate, the thing that we know for certain is that when we pass this health care exchange, Washington, D.C. will have more say over our health care system, and an unelected board will be making more health care decisions than our legislature. And for that reason, ladies and gentlemen, I would urge a red vote. Is there any other discussion? Senator Chamberlain. Well, I had in mind a final question, but I'll, I'll spare everybody that. But uh, a few final comments. Uh, something comes to mind about who's looking out for real Minnesotans, all those folks out there in the state. And this is a historic day. I think all of you would agree to that. But I would submit it's historically bad for all Minnesota, for the children, our vulnerable citizens. I also submit it's a sad day for me and for Minnesotans. Tonight, you will vote to end health care the way we've known it in Minnesota. You will vote to end that. And as Senator Weber said, a health care system that has led the nation in cost, quality, access, and innovation. It's a day I never thought I'd live to see in this state. Honestly, I didn't. Pretty melodramatic for you, Senator Dibble. Senator Lori, Governor Dayton, you'll have your names in the history books, right? You'll be known, you'll be remembered. You'll do it. Thank you, Senator Saxhawk. You'll have your health care exchange. An exchange the governor himself has said as a gamble, and he doesn't know if it's going to work. Well, isn't that something? We're going to risk all this and submit all of our citizens to a gamble that he doesn't know will work. It's quite a hypothetical, Senator Carlson. A sad day. Senator Lorry, Senator Johnson, Senator Dahl, tonight you'll vote for this health care exchange. But next week, people will feel the impact of what you've done tonight. Jobs will be lost, and hours will be reduced, and people will lose money. And soon, people will lose their health care coverage and moved off of their employers into this exchange, which I hope you keep your promise that we will be part of. During the committee hearings, we heard and learned that access will not be improved. We learned that people, not everybody's going to be covered. And after all, that was one of the main reasons for this exchange, to get people covered by health, in health insurance. Costs will not decrease. We've seen reams of information and data that have said that. Yet, you'll vote for it tonight. Costs will increase by almost 50% for some people, for most people, but you'll vote for it tonight. Many people would simply choose to go without coverage and go for the automatic opt-in. Costs will increase. Tonight, you'll pass this off the floor, 
And again, you'll have your name in the history books. But next week, real people will see the impact of your decisions. And in a year, everybody is going to know what you've done here tonight. Now, in closing, I'd like to change directions a little bit. In this body, we sometimes, we always get hung up in the numbers and the legalese, the commas, where the conjunctions are, and what all that means. But there are some bigger issues, I think, we need to become reacquainted with. Now, for some of you, this might go over the top a bit. But I, like others in this body and outside of here, volunteered to serve this country. For me, the Navy and the Army. I got bored after my divorce, so I joined the Army. And you know, for me, in my humble opinion, for me, I didn't join to serve a government or politicians. I joined for an idea. And for me, that idea was the idea of America and what it meant and what comes along with that. And I know for some of you, this is just sap. This is just for, you know, bygone ideology. It doesn't mean anything. Well, you know, on the office of my wall, I don't have pictures of politicians, except the gallery shot and myself on the wall with my family. But I do have other things on the wall. One of the things I have on the wall, my wife bought me. And it says, if all the sea were ink and the earth parchment, it would not serve to describe the blessings of liberty. Now that's some of the stuff that we don't think about or talk at all in two years here in this body. But that is one of the things that we're charged with protecting. Around here, throughout the halls, look up and read some of that stuff sometime. It means something. It used to. Well, and I'll end with this. And I truly mean this. And some of you, this is just over the top still. But I'm heavy hearted. I truly am. And inside, I'll grieve. I truly will for what Minnesotans have lost tonight. And we have lost a lot when you cast your vote. I don't expect I'll change any votes, but we've lost a lot. Senator Chamberlain, Madam President. Senator Chamberlain, just a cautionary note. Rule 36.2 says that the member shall speak only to the question under debate and avoid personality. Thank you. Other discussion? Senator Latz. Uh, Madam President, you just cited the rule that I was going to raise. Thank you. Senator Madam President? Senator Chamberlain. I truly apologize for that indiscretion. But this bill tonight is one of the biggest indiscretions, biggest blemish the state has ever seen. So I tr I'm sorry. You got back down to what was it, 36B? 36.2. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Other discussion? Senator Franson. Thank you, Madam President. And I, I do feel compelled to add to the debate in my own terms and after being here for almost, I don't know, 11 hours, listening to amendment after amendment, point after point. Uh, and, I, and I do am kind of sad because I've been in the legislature for, I think, three months now. But this body had two years since the law federal law came to be March of 2010. So when I hear the discussion that we're rushing things, that we didn't have time to debate, we didn't have time in committee, I really question that because technically you had two years to work on this as a body collectively and you chose not to. So that's what's sad because I worked really hard to get here to represent my constituents and my state 
because I saw that failed leadership here. And to come today and spend 11 hours to act like we didn't talk about this because we didn't have time, it's really disrespectful to the process. So I needed to say that. And I do commend Senator Lori for his battle tonight and throughout the last three months. I just met you. <laughs> and you've done a lot to move this, excuse me, to, Madam President, to do a lot for, for this debate and to really have the best exchange that we can. And I'm going to vote for this. I'm going to vote for this exchange because I believe we need a Minnesota-based exchange. I've said that from the beginning. And I wish we had more cooperation from all of you in this room, in this chamber. And I really didn't see that. And it's not perfect. There's a lot of things that I don't agree with on, on the bill right now, but we, I voted my conscience on some of the changes. They didn't go through, but I thought I expressed where I stood. And I feel comfortable in my, with my decision to support this bill. And I think we'll do Minnesota a great service by having a Minnesota-based exchange and not a federally mandated one. So you can hear all the rhetoric you want. That's my, my opinion, that this is the best move for our state. And that I hope that we can move together in the next part of the session and the years to come to make this even better and iron out any issues that we have with the exchange because it's not perfect and there are a lot of unknowns. We all know that. I have my inbox filled with emails from constituents, from businesses. I met with plenty of them to tell me all the concerns that they have and I think I've expressed them. So I think we still have a lot of work to do but this is not uh, the end of, 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 of the debate on the exchanges and, and we are going to have to work together on, on improving it. So. I feel comfortable with my decision, and I again commend Senator Lori for his leadership on this, and I hope that we can um, at least find some compromise some point in this session. Thank you. Is there any more discussion? Senator Newman. Madam President, uh, point of uh, parliamentary inquiry. State your point. Uh, when uh, Senator Franzen uh, makes reference to the, to the uh, fact that the amendments were that were offered today uh, on the floor were disrespectful to the process. Is that a violation of Rule 36.2, where she entered uh, into discussion concerning personalities? Uh, because she didn't mention any particular names, I would my advice would be that it would not be a violation of the rule. It's when you get into personality and you mention individual names that then it's a violation of the rule. Uh, Senator Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Madam President. I take a look at Minnesota's current system, and a chart was handed out earlier today that showed Minnesota out front a leader. High quality, low cost. That's our position today. And this is an exchange bill, all right. It's gonna exchange that high quality, low cost, and exchange that for a heavy-handed bureaucracy with tremendous power, limited oversight, innumerable powers, and then exempted from the open process of rulemaking and many other exemptions. Wow, we're going to exchange our wonderful system for that. That is not the Minnesota way. Minnesota currently, we are right here now in this chamber. We publish things. We make our case, we argue for, against. We're here in the public with the cameras, with others watching us with openness. It's the whole essence of Minnesota state government. It's, it's what we fought so hard to put all of those things in place that are going to be exempted. And for what? We have a valuable system. Let's not exchange that. This is so important. Not only that, the risk of your data. Think of this. Your tax data, your income tax data, medical, family, 
other private data as necessary, another one of those caveats. Who's it going to be shared with? The IRS, Social Security, Homeland Security, Department of Justice, Immigration, and what's the answer to all that? Just trust the government. Just trust us, those of you presenting this. That is not what this whole system is put together around. It's put in a type of respectful, not trusting, because we want openness, we want transparency, we want those rulemaking, we want those things because we need that, because there's a healthy skepticism that comes with what is happening that affects all of us so closely, our children, our grandchildren. This is serious. Don't exchange what is so good for something that is so full of questions. We heard from the US Supreme Court just this last summer. That was a big question that was hanging out there that due process said, let's wait for our US Supreme Court. Having done so, now we followed through with this part of the process. I don't just trust our government without the openness that our laws and our rules require and bring to this. The fact that this has been exempted is one of the biggest reasons why I will vote no on this bill. Members, I ask you to stay true to Minnesota what is so good. Don't exchange it for something that can do so much harm. Thank you. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President, and Madam President, uh, Senator Chamberlain, I apologize if I was shaking my head too emphatically at his, at his speech. It was disrespectful. I apologize for that. But uh, Madam President and uh, Senator Kiffmeyer and others, I don't, I don't understand what we're talking about, about preserving what's so good in our system. We know that about 9.1% of our folks in Minnesota don't have insurance, and that's going up and it hasn't recovered yet. Madam President, members, I have two siblings who work very hard and don't have health insurance and they don't qualify for any of our public plans. My husband who runs a small business pays for very, very expensive health insurance that consumes most of his monthly income every month. So, Madam President, members, to Senator Franzen's point earlier, we had a long time to work on this, and that was blocked by the previous majority. And the healthcare exchange actually was originally an idea that came out of conservative think tanks and was one of the ideas uh, that was championed by then Governor Pawlenty back in the day as a way to preserve the free market aspect of our healthcare system and address this issue of no insurance and underinsurance that's causing so many of our hardworking folks in Minnesota to continue to struggle despite all of their best efforts. This is a reasonable approach to extending a decent set of health care benefits in an, in an affordable manner to a whole lot more people who simply don't have access to health care right now. I have another sibling and her husband who do have health insurance but through a public, but through a public system, but thank God for that because they struggle with significant health care, health issues in their lives. Otherwise, Lord only knows what circumstance they would be in because of their health struggles, significant health issues that they struggle with. I have yet to hear from those critics of the Affordable Care Act and the health exchange a reasonable approach to addressing the issue of, in our country, of 50 million folks who don't have health insurance and another 10, 15 million who are underinsured. That is unacceptable and unconscionable in this country and in this state that generates more wealth than any other place on earth. To just simply leave people out. You want to talk about rationing? That's rationing, Madam President. And that's unacceptable. Senator Nino. Thank you, Madam President. We have a bill before us, and every member here is going to vote their conscience, vote their best judgment. 
But we have a bill here before us that is deeply flawed in many ways. At least when it started, it had a mechanism to pay for itself. I didn't think it was the best mechanism, but it was an honest mechanism. It was a 3.5% tax on premiums. Would have caused basically everyone's insurance premiums to go up, but it was honest, paid for itself. What we have in front of us now is a gimmick. We take money out of a health impact fund that is essentially general fund money with no way to backfill it in a year when we have a deficit. So where does that money come from? Now granted, it's not a whole lot of money in the next year and a half, but if you take a look at the fiscal note in the next few years, we put a $130 million hole in the general fund. And that's not hypothetical, that's real. Where does that money come from? Education? Welfare? Healthcare? Food stamps? It's coming from somewhere, and we don't have the answer. Tax increase? Maybe, but that is hypothetical. Now worse, worse than the fact that we don't know where the money's gonna come from, we know what pool it's coming out of, but we don't know how we're gonna fill it because we have a deficit in our budget right now. Worse than that, we have a, bud, a board of seven members, and of course you only need a majority, so four people who will determine a budget that according to the fiscal note, you know, it's 50, 55 million dollars a year. But there's nothing to limit that at all. We tried time and again here on the floor to add good policy measures, to put some measure of checks and balances and restraints or capitation or anything. We tried every possible solution. They were all rejected. So now, because we have the health impact fund as the funding mechanism, and a board that gets to determine their own budget and no checks and balances on restraining that budget moving forward, just an automatic shall certify and shall move the funds, you have, and members, I have to tell you that every town hall meeting I've had, here's the line I've used, and I get the craziest looks, and they go, and the public says, are you nuts? Are you nuts? Here's what we have. And we tried to fix, for, for 11 hours, we tried to fix this here on the floor. We have an unelected, unaccountable, unrestrainable board that cannot be removed by anyone but themselves, who sets their own budget, who pays for that budget out of a fund that has $200 million a year. So that's the one limit that they have, right there. That is the one singular limit that this board has. They can't spend more than about $200 million a year on their own budget. If they try to go above that, there won't be enough money to write the check for them. But nothing else can stop them other than their own self-restraint. And I sure hope they have a lot if this is what the final product looks like. But I talk to people and I say, you have an unelected board that cannot be removed from office except by themselves, who sets their own budget, writes their own check. What could go wrong with that? And people look at me and said, whose crazy idea was that? That's nuts. And you know what? They're right. They are absolutely right. The guy in the street gets it. And I guess, once this goes to conference committee, the best alternative is we're gonna tax your health insurance and make your premiums rise 3.5%. Well, there's a good alternative. Members, we can vote no. We could come back on Monday. Heck, we'd come back tomorrow, why not? 
We could start a new bill. We can get it done. We could go down to room 15. We can meet here 24 hours a day. I volunteer. I'll be on the working group. And let's find something that makes sense, that the regular person out on the street doesn't look at me and go, are you nuts? Because that's not the kind of legislation we should be passing. Senator Skoy. Thank you, Madam President and members. I was interested to listen to Senator Ninao talk about the financing of this bill, and then I got a little confused as he concluded, because in his discussion, he was talking about 3.5% withhold on health insurance premiums resulting in a $130 million health insurance premium increase, and I got the feeling that he didn't think that was a good idea, and I don't either, and we offered an alternative. And it comes out of Governor Plenty's health impact fund. And yes, it is general fund dollars. But it seems like that's a better mechanism than the other alternative. And the other choice that there is tonight is whether we're going to have a Minnesota plan or a federal plan. And if you vote no to the Minnesota plan, then you're for the federal plan. And that does have a 3.5% withhold in it. So that's the choice that we're facing tonight. So keep it clear, you can wax nostalgically about the good old days of health insurance, but that is not the choice that we're facing today. And I think Minnesota can do a better job, and I think Minnesota can figure out a better funding mechanism, and I wish the conference committee well, and I thank Senator Laurie for his efforts tonight. Senator Dames. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, when I came back to the beginning of the session in early January, I didn't come with any rose-colored glasses on. I didn't have any preconceived notions. I fully understood that we were gonna have a state health exchange. So I got a copy of the bill, and I went to page three, section seven. And when I read that, I got pretty excited. It talked about the Minnesota insurance marketplace is created too, and it listed 11 areas that we're gonna promote. And I thought, you know, if we can promote those 11 areas and make a good bill, this is going to be the way to go. Then I started reading the rest of the bill and quite frankly got quite concerned. But I was fortunate enough to be in the Commerce Committee. The bill came to the Commerce Committee. The bill was presented to us. We started asking questions. We talked about how this is going to make health insurance more affordable. Didn't get any answers. We talked about how this was going to encourage and increase competition. Didn't get any answers. We talked about why we had an oversight board that didn't answer to basically anybody and didn't have much oversight. Really didn't get many answers. But I didn't give up because I was told that this was a bare bones bill and it was going to go through several more committees and we were going to put meat and flesh on, this, on these bones, and we were going to come up with a pretty good bill. Now, I don't know how many other committees this bill went through. I'm going to guess probably seven to nine committees. We come here today, pretty much the same bill that came out of Commerce Committee. If there's meat and flesh been put on it, it must have deteriorated before it got here tonight, because the bill is basically what it was to start with. So we listened to about 38 amendments, hoping that we could do what we said we were gonna do on page three under section seven. And I'd like to call that a mission statement. That's not definitely what it's referred to here, but whatever you wanna call it, I'll call it a mission statement. And I think it's really unfortunate that uh, we were here tonight offering amendments, trying to make this bill stronger and trying to make the bill better in order that we could have a health, health, exchange, health insurance exchange in the state of Minnesota that we could have that could be second to none. It could contain cost. It could increase competition. Could be a more affordable and have oversight. But here we are tonight. We're looking at passing a bill and then figuring out later what we're gonna to do to make the bill work. We're asking our members to vote for a bill, and as I asked the question earlier, 
I didn't get any response of how many people talked to the local school boards to see how, much, how this might affect them. Senator Ingerbritsen brought up the impact this could have on our local counties. Yet, as we find out, that wasn't even included in the fiscal note. So when I take a look at this, it really does bother me that we put all this work into this. We started with bare bones, and if we put flesh on it, like I said, it's decayed already. We have a bill that we're gonna be presenting to Minnesota, and we're gonna be telling them how hard we work for them, yet nobody can tell me how it's gonna be more affordable, nobody can tell me how it's gonna be more competitive. We have a board that has very little oversight, and nobody can tell me how it's going to affect our local counties and our local schools. And I'm not gonna be able to vote for a bill and pass a bill and then try to figure out what the effect is gonna be later. I don't think my constituents sent me here to do that type, type of legislation, and so I will not be voting for the bill, and I would ask that you folks do the same. Senator Bonoff. Madam I'm President. sorry, Mr. Senator Bonoff. Um, Senator Thompson was next. Thank you, Madam President and members. You know, uh, something was made earlier of the fact that the previous majority didn't take care of this issue. Well, there's a reason for that. And the reason is that taking care of this issue is allowing ourselves to comply with and, in many of our opinions, be pushed around by the federal government in a way that we believe is dangerous, in a way that we believe infringes on the Tenth Amendment, which I know is kind of out of vogue these days. But some of us care about that. Some of us care about Minnesota families, people in Minnesota, the opportunities that they have and, and the ability to control their own health insurance decisions and the kinds of things they do. And that's why some of us, and by the way, it wasn't unanimous. We had lots of discussions about it within our caucus. And I'll be honest with you, I wasn't certain of the way to go when I first started thinking about this thing. Because as Senator Scoy correctly pointed out, whether we like it or not, this is getting put upon us. But I finally came to the conclusion that I had to stand on principle and say, how can I facilitate what I consider to be basically the takeover of our state by the federal government in a way that I think is unconstitutional and I think it's dangerous? So yes, we did stand against it, and I'm glad I did. And by the way, that doesn't excuse abusing the process now. Uh, it, it seems that there's sort of been this implication, well, we can go ahead and speed things through and and not give the same kind of committee attention because the previous majority didn't do something. I'm unaware of that rule. I think that due process and, and, the, and the committee process is, it should be done correctly no matter what was or wasn't done in a previous legislative session. Now let's get down to the uh, practical part of this. Senator Scoy is so correct. It's not the good old days anymore. <laughs> No, our health insurance now is not dictated by legislators here in this body or the people of Minnesota, but rather it's pretty much dictated by the federal government. So there's no question when it comes to our health care, Dorothy has left Kansas. And I'm not so sure we're going to like it. And you know, health care is a kind of a complicated subject. We talk about deductibles and HMOs and, and MCHA and Minnesota Care, and all these things get confusing. But Let's just take a simple analogy. Let's say that I came to you and said, you know what? I really think we've got a problem with the way food is delivered in this state. I don't think our restaurants are doing things the way they ought to do it. There's McDonald's and Burger King and Arby's and, and all of these other various restaurants out there. But you know what? I think what we need to do to make them more competitive and reduce costs is let's set up a board. And let's spend about over a hundred million dollars getting this thing going. Let's spend sixty million dollars a year administering it. Let's get all the menus from all the restaurants and restrict what they can sell and how they can sell it. And let's make all of these restaurants apply and we'll let some in and we'll exclude others and we're gonna have better food at a lower price. You would say that I am clinically insane. But that's exactly what we're doing with health insurance right now. All of these insurance companies are out there. There was a reference earlier to all of the potential policies that could be bought. I had somebody do the same kind of analysis, go on to online 
to one of these websites to, to, to price out health insurance. Pages and pages of alternatives with high deductibles, low deductibles, priced all the way from 57 bucks a month up to a few hundred dollars a month. But somehow, if we just get rid of some of these companies and put together a big bureaucracy and have them run by a board, it's all gonna get less expensive and more efficient. Who are you trying to kid? It's anti-competitive. So this is bad government because we're doing things that we shouldn't do, which is vest power in unelected boards and with people that aren't accountable directly to the citizens of this state. And it's horrible economics in that it's, it's Orwellian. We're talking about increasing competition while we're reducing choices and reducing providers. So. Um, Obviously, I will be voting no on this bill, and I would encourage the rest of you to vote no, and, and let's, uh, let's try to improve the system that we have here. And I will say I don't understand the uninsured people in this state. There are all kinds of private insurance options. Some of them I see here with payments as low as $57.71 a month. But if you can't afford that, then there's a sliding scale with Minnesota Care that'll get you in. So my understanding is pretty much if you are willing to get yourself to the building to apply for the program, virtually everybody in this state has the opportunity to be insured. And I'm with Senator Chamberlain and the rest of the folks that have said to throw this system aside for what even our governor has said is a gamble, is a gamble we shouldn't be making. Senator Bonner. Thank you, Madam President. I have to stand and, and speak about what I think about the bill that is before us and this discussion because I didn't want my vote and uh, my not speaking to be an occasion for people to think I agreed with all of the conversation that I've been hearing from those who plan to vote no. Because in fact, I stand with Senator Lurie for most of this discussion. I believe strongly in a health care exchange. I see its importance and its value. I personally have family members with pre-existing conditions and after the Affordable Care Act was passed, I breathed a sigh of relief that I don't have to have sleepless nights about whether or not they would be covered. I have three children who are between the ages of 21 and 26 on my health care plan, so again, that was a welcome thought. And for many years, I have felt as though in the American system, the way we force our businesses to carry the burden of health insurance on their backs was actually unfair and put us in a disadvantaged competitive place. And so I had been hoping for a new system whereby insurance could be portable and people could bring it with them and they could have the buying power of a group without being in a group and whereby small businesses didn't have to worry about the overhead of providing health insurance. And so in principle, I stand strongly for this health care exchange. But each of us comes to the legislature with their own style and for those who have worked with me over the years, you will find out that my style is I can be very strong-minded and unyielding when I believe something and therefore I vote uh, in accordance with my belief. And so I supported a, a couple of the amendments that Julie Rosen brought forward because I believed strongly that they would make this exchange more consistent with the way that I viewed it. And so because those amendments didn't go on and, um, and I had told Senator Lurie I was going to um, see it that way, that I'm going to, to wait and see how this comes back from conference and hopes. And I will continue to work with Senator Lurie, but I do want it set on the record that I believe strongly in the health exchange and that um, I will continue working with uh, whoever is on the conference committee to, to see if I can't be um, at, at the end of this discussion in a place where I'm a strong supporter of it. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I met with Senator Lori when this bill started its long journey through the legislative process, and at our meeting we agreed that a Minnesota, the right Minnesota solution was preferable to a federally imposed system. Now, I worked through the committee process. We, we put together amendments. Um, Senator Franz and I have been through some of the same leadership training, and uh, 
we work hard to, to advance our ideas, and we tried to work hard in the, in the uh, committee process to make the changes that would garner bipartisan support, and the significant amendments fell on a party line vote. So I don't believe this is the right solution for Minnesota. Our focus in this bill has been how to grow government, how to build a complex system, and how to delegate unprecedented authority to a new board. And we've lost our focus on the consumer. And we've lost our focus on how this board will affect the health insurance industry and jobs in that industry that are here in Minnesota. I have several concerns with this bill, and we've talked about them today. First, the exchange is not designed to be a marketplace. It's designed to be a market manipulator. In very simple terms, the active purchaser provisions are allowing the exchange board to limit competition. Health insurance providers generally earn less than a 2% profit margin, hardly a windfall and hardly egregious. Limiting competition will reduce choices to consumers and it will potentially drive these insurance providers out of business. I'm concerned about the governance of this board and it does not reflect the entire marketplace. As it currently sits, the board is appointed by the governor and excludes representation from all stakeholders a board of seven politically appointed members and with an active purchaser provision is ripe for corruption. A marketplace of issuers, agents, consumers, those from greater Minnesota, those from the metro area, healthcare providers and insurance companies should be a part of the governance of this marketplace if we truly want a transparent and ethical process. There are concerns with the rulemaking process that Senator Newman so well described, and I share his concerns. The rulemaking process is meant to make sure, is, is to make sure that we make deliberate decisions, not nimble changes, so that we minimize the probability of unintended consequences. Now, I know there are tight timelines with the federal government and, that, and, and, and what they've imposed. But I would rather miss a deadline than pass a bill that's bad for Minnesota consumers. Minnesota workers and the Minnesota business community. I'm not voting against the mandate of the Affordable Health Care Act, although I disagree with it. I'm voting no on an exchange that creates a new government entity, manipulates the health insurance market, increases the cost of insurance, and does nothing to improve health care. The government called this a gamble, and I think the responsible decision of this body is not to make that bet. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is there any further discussion? Senator Rosen. Thank you, Madam President. Again, as I started off today, I'd like to thank Senator Lori. I think, Senator Lori, you handled this very gracefully, and you truly are a statesman and I appreciate your work on this. And I stood with you on the January 9th press conference in a bipartisan manner with great hope that would, would be, we would be able to develop an exchange bill that would transform our Minnesota made health system. And I know, Senator Lurie, that you have the best intentions with this bill, but so do we on this side. And we've worked very hard in the committees to make the changes that were appropriate to, to give a bipartisan bill that we felt was the best intention for the state of Minnesota. We offered some really reasonable amendments today that should have been accepted and they were rejected. Amendments that we truly felt would make this exchange better and again make it bipartisan. Reasonable amendments that would make this, this a historic change in our health care system. But what we have here is a system and exchange bill that has no accountability with still many, many unanswered questions. And Senator Lori, I know you've been working on this a very long time. I'm somewhat puzzled why we didn't see any amendments coming from your side of the aisle in committee or even hardly on the floor here. The bill you crafted last year was 
uh, crafted off the recommendations from the governor's health care or uh, uh, exchange task force. So I'm not quite sure where this bill came from. I still am puzzled about these recommendations. And so as the governor said in the Star Tribune on Monday, it's the law, it's federal law, and we are going to do our best here in Minnesota. That's what he said, folks. Well, members, we failed. We did not make the exchange bill better. We did not serve our state well. So I stand here with a very heavy heart because I cannot and will not support this bill. Is there any more discussion? Madam President. Senator Ham. Thank you. It is late. We started this a long time ago. And like uh, so many times when we have these long debates, everything's been said, but not by everybody. And I would like to make a couple of comments. And I would say that uh, I want to thank members of our caucus who have worked very hard in the committee and members on the other side as well, who I know have worked very hard. It's been a long committee process. And I also want to thank Senator Laurie. I know he's worked very hard, and I know how hard it is to be on the floor for an extended period of time defending a bill. And uh, he deserves our appreciation, all of us, even those who asked him questions and were arguing against him, because I do believe that that's helpful for the public to understand what's in a bill and what is in the decisions that we have to make. And I thank you, Senator Laurie, for your willingness to do this. And defending what I believe is something that is, in fact, indefensible, which is this bill. And to me, it represents really the triumph of uh, partisan politics over common sense. And this is a bill, this is part of a very, very partisan process, partisan project that started at the federal government. And we know the history, how that happened. And it's filtered down to the states. And what we're seeing happen here is sort of a microcosm of what happened in Washington. And we had, throughout this year, uh, a very sincere, as Senator Rosen and others have mentioned, after the election, an effort to say, well, we heard a lot of talk about bipartisanship, and we heard a lot of talk about working together, and we heard a lot of talk about trying to recognize reality, and so let's create a bill that will do the best we can for the people of Minnesota. But there was no cooperation. There was no bipartisanship. I don't know how many amendments were offered in committees. I've 20 or 30, and we had uh, several more. Many of those that we offered tonight were very similar to the things we offered in committee, and all of them were turned away. And it's hard to see that this is anything but a bill that was created, as was mentioned by, by others, as a partisan bill and was resistant to any change from day one. That there was a vision in place at the very beginning of what this bill was supposed to be like, and that vision was preserved and maintained throughout the process, and every effort to try to offer amendments to say, let's, let's bring some accountability, let's bring some changes to governance, let's bring some, some things that protect the interests of consumers to this bill, let's, let's try to uh, deal with the costs, let's put some things that, that, that are sensible to this, that from our side at least we think are sensible, and all those things, all those things were turned away. And so we talk about, let's be bipartisan, let's be bipartisan. And even the smallest things, putting one member on a governing board that has an interest in the thing being governed was too much for the majority to accept, too much. And so it's hard to look at this as anything except a very partisan exercise to achieve a very partisan goal. And I think even if you look at who supports the bill and who opposes the bill, and on one hand, you see the supporters, given the list we have, and you see AFSCME and SEIU and Take Action Minnesota, which are very partisan organizations, very political organizations. On the other side, you see the business community, NFIB and Chamber, and Business Partnership and others, and you see the insurers and the agent community, consumers all saying, we don't like this bill, and many of them say we are not opposed to the idea of an exchange if it is a market exchange, if it is a marketplace, but that's not what this bill is. And we had some discussion tonight about that. And a marketplace has some features to it, and I think those features have been 
expressed in the amendments we brought tonight on the floor and we brought in committee, and all those things were turned away, which to me, again, reinforces the idea that this bill is consistent with a vision that's being brought that isn't consistent with the idea of a marketplace, which is what many people who support an exchange wanted to see happen. We talk about costs, and that's been, for many of us, the central question. We've heard a lot, well, we're going to save money. This is something that's going to save money. Healthcare costs are rising. We need this thing to save money. And what we do know is that this exchange is going to cost us a lot of money. 100 million, 200 million, 300 million over four or five years. We know that, and that is not hypothetical. That is a certainty. That we know on top of everything else we do in healthcare, we're adding an additional cost with this bill. That is a certainty. And what we're told is, well, we're going to save money. We're going to save money when we do this. But I have not yet heard how this will save money. Now, what I do know from what I've understood and how this works is that the savings are going to happen because we're going to get large federal subsidies that are going to come in. That's how we're going to save money. Now, that's, let's understand that. We're not saving money. We're not reducing costs. We're just having the federal government pay for the increased costs that are going to happen. Because as has been pointed out here tonight, and you can read all the Gruben, uh, Gorman Gruber report and others that under Obamacare, premiums are going to go up 20, 30, 40 percent, and then they're going to be offset by the subsidies that are going to come from the federal government. So the costs are going to go up. The prices to some consumers are going to go down because of massive subsidies going to come into the exchange. That's called savings in the DFL world, apparently. That doesn't mean savings to me, because that money that's coming from the federal government is going to come from someplace, either from the pockets of taxpayers, or it's going to be borrowed from the Chinese, or it's going to be printed in inflation dollars. But at some point, that bill is going to come due to our children, our grandchildren, somewhere along the line, and it's going to be substantial. And so this is not saving cost. It is adding significant cost. We talked a lot about accountability. We talked about transparency. We talked about privacy issues. Those are all things of a marketplace. They're absent in this bill. And we talked about choices. What is a marketplace? A marketplace is the ultimate choice. It's where people freely go and say, I want to buy something and I want to sell something, and people agree to do it on their own terms. And what we heard tonight, or today during the bill, is that what choice really means is that some people get to decide for everybody else that it's not how many things you get to choose from, but there are some people who are going to decide there are a few things that they know are good for us, are better for us, and we're going to choose them for you, and that's what choice means. Choice means a four people in this governing board get to decide for everybody else what the best choices are, and they will make those choices for all of us, and that's for our own good. That's what choice means, I guess, in the DFL world. That's not a marketplace, at least in my understanding of it. But that's what this bill does. That's what we're going to do. This bill was introduced eight weeks ago, I think almost exactly. And I've heard it described as the most significant change in health care policy in the last 50 years. And I frankly don't think the track record on Medicare and Medicaid is that great. And people may argue with me on that, but that's my opinion. But that's even if that's true, most significant change in health care policy, and it happened in eight weeks from introduction to final passage. And there are a lot of new members on the floor here tonight. And many of you are going to vote for this bill. And you're going to have to answer questions, maybe not tonight, maybe not tomorrow, but at some point, and you're going to have to explain what did you do and why did you do it. And I hope you have the answers because I know many of you were not in the committees that heard these bills, and even the ones that were in the committees, I know there were questions that were asked but weren't answered. And I know we had a lot of questions here tonight that were asked and not answered. And I know there's a lot of questions that were asked that people don't know the answers to because they were hypotheticals and they're things that people just don't know. But it will be a significant change. And I don't think it'll be a change for the better, because as has been said before by many that we have in this state one of the best health care systems in the world, if not the best. Not perfect, but a very good system. And one that we are going to throw away on a gamble. And why? 
and going back to one of the very first comments, Senator Lori, that you made earlier this morning, that this is being dictated by requirements of the federal law. That's why we're doing it, because we're being dictated to by federal law. So we're going to take this thing that we have built under Minnesota law by Minnesota voters electing Minnesota representatives accountable to Minnesota voters, and we're going to say, nope. The federal law is going to come in and say, throw that out and do what we tell you to do, and that's what we're going to do. And that's why we're doing it. And that's why we're doing it on this shortened time frame. And that's why we're going down this process so quickly and putting all these things in place and why we can't make any changes. And then we're going to call it Minnesota based because we get to put the word Minnesota on it. Well, I don't believe that's really Minnesota based, it has the name, but you know, there's a famous story about Abraham Lincoln and they said uh, he was in an argument with somebody and he said, uh, well, uh, uh, how many legs does a sheep have? And the guy said, uh, four. And Lincoln said, well, if I call the sheep's tail a leg, how many legs does a sheep have? And the guy said, five. And Lincoln said, well, calling the tail of a sheep a leg doesn't make it so. And so calling this a Minnesota-based health care exchange doesn't make it so. This is a federal project that we are being asked to do over the best interests of the people of the Minnesota and against things that we already have in place that are serving our people well and can be improved and ought to be improved by Minnesota lawmakers in this body. And the last thing I guess I'd say, and I know there's been some frustration by members in this body, maybe on the other side, and why are you going on so long and why have you guys done all this? And all I would say is, I think there's a lot of passion on this issue. I know on members on our side of the aisle, there's a lot of passion, a lot of feeling on this. And I think it reflects a lot of feeling that people have outside of this body in the state of Minnesota. There are a lot of people, a lot of citizens who are very, very passionate about this idea because it strikes at some very central things. People's health care is very personal. And decisions about what they do for themselves and their family are very personal. And what we're doing is we're, we're doing some very fundamental things, some very large things to that very fundamental equation. And I don't believe anybody in this room really understands what's going to happen next year when we do this. It's a huge gamble, as Governor Dayton has said. But one thing I think is a big difference is that on our side, at least for me, I, I think that it is better to try to create a system that allows people to make decisions for themselves. Let's put in place processes and, and, and procedures and plans or programs. Let's put in place things that give people choices, give people opportunities to make choices for themselves. Choose their doctors, choose their insurers, choose their plans. We may not agree with them. We might not think they're right, but let's let them do that. And I think. You folks on the other side, I think what, what you say is, well, we just can't allow that. We can't allow somebody to make a bad decision. We can't allow somebody to choose a health insurance plan that we know isn't right for them. We can't allow that. We have to make sure they only have these two or three to choose from. And even though they're astronomically costly, that's all right. We'll get the federal government to come in and pay for the cost and everything will be great until we run out of money. But there's a huge difference. And for us on this side of the aisle, we think that that ability to preserve the, the rights of people to make choices is central. So I apologize for our side going on as long as we have. It, it's, uh, I think it's sincerely an expression of the concern and interest that people on this side of the aisle have had. There's differences of opinion. We're not all the same. There are people who really wanted to see an exchange and others who may not have. But there was a very sincere interest to work with the majority to get a bill that represented a true marketplace. That I will tell you with certainty. And you might not have gotten every Republican to vote for it, but you certainly would have had a bipartisan bill. And that didn't happen. And I regret that, and I will be voting no. Is there any more discussion? Senator Lorry. Thank you, Madam President. It's been a long day, a long evening, and I really appreciate uh, members' attention and, and really appreciate the debate. And there's absolutely no need to apologize for the fact that it is a long debate. 
I fully recognize how important and, and critical these decisions are for the people of Minnesota, for our economy, and for our health care system in particular. Uh, a couple of things, you know, we, we did adopt some meaningful amendments. We adopted 17 amendments today when I counted and just scrolled through here. Um, through the committee process, we've been through nine committees, uh, over 27 hours of testimony, something close to 100 testifiers came forward in those uh, nine hearings. We made significant and meaningful changes to rulemaking provisions, to data practices, to the appeals processes uh, for insurance producers, our ag agents and our brokers to make the system work for them better. Uh, criteria around the selection for the board to help uh, narrow that target to make it work for industry. Uh, added a legislative oversight committee, changed the funding mechanism. This bill was introduced as a bare bones bill and we did um, work on it and, and fleshed it out throughout the system. And I, I do believe that we have a bill that we can be very proud of at this stage of the game. You know, I think we're going to send it over to the House, and, and my guess is they're not going to concur. They had their own process over there that was similarly um, uh, detailed and engaged, and they have some different ideas. And we'll go into conference committee, presuming I, uh, I'm successful in passing this bill in a few minutes, and we'll hammer those out again, and we'll come back here and we'll have some of the same debates. But at the end of the day, we're going to have a tool for Minnesota consumers, families, individuals, businesses, uh, to for the first time be able to shop on an apples to apples comparison for insurance products. We're going to have a board that is able to be trusted by consumers because it's conflict free and this board is going to be able to drive value out of the system in ways that are going to be incredibly beneficial for people. We've heard about the effects of the ACA. These are unavoidable. Um, it is true that through guaranteed issue and richer benefit sets for individuals through the ACA, there will be premium increases. Those premium increases will be uh, more than offset for 70% of individuals uh, that, that are able to gain tax credits and cost sharing reductions through, through the federal government. But in addition to that, those increases uh, in, in benefit sets and in guaranteed issue, individuals will get more comprehensive coverage and pay less out of pocket in deductibles and co-pays. The uninsured that have a pent up demand will finally begin to have access to the health care services they need to maintain their health. Individuals will no longer be denied insurance coverage by insurance companies and coverage for pre-existing conditions will no longer be denied. Those enrolled in UMCHA will have a better set of choices available to them and they will no longer have to pay 25 percent higher premiums than those uh, without those pre-existing conditions. Additional cost savings not calculated into the, uh, into the cost effects. MCHA assessments will be able to go away when we're able to phase MCHA out. Those are $168 million borne by our businesses today. And the Department of Health calculated that there's going to be over $150 million of uncompensated care costs that are borne by today's uh, provider market, uh, provider community that will go away. Those also uh, are a one-to-one -one, um, uh, take up on insurance rates borne by the fully insured market. Uh, there's also been a lot of talk today about Governor Dayton's statement that this is a gamble, and it's true. We are gambling. We have to, we have to make a decision. The Affordable Care Act is the law of the land. It has been upheld by the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. Um, the President won re-election. It, it's going to stand. We are going to have to implement an exchange. The question before us today is whether we implement a federal exchange, allow a federal exchange to be implemented, or do a state-based exchange. And so in this gamble, I'm going to bet on the state of Minnesota. I'm going to bet that our industry is going to step forward and be able to produce the products that are of better value for our consumers, our families, our individuals, and our small businesses. I'm going to bet on Minnesota's health care community, that they're going to be able to embrace these reforms and really bring about the triple aims of health care to find, uh, have better individual experiences in our interactions with the health care system, to have better population-based health statistics, something that we've all been striving for. And if we achieve these first two aims well, we will easily achieve the third aim, which is to bend the cost curve at the end of the day and really uh, produce the results that we're all looking for in the health care system. This is a good bill. It's going to be a big step in the right direction. We have a little way to go yet through the conference committee process, and I look forward to that, and we'll continue 
to engage in an open and honest dialogue about these important issues. And thank you for uh, the uh, really good debate today. I the, urge a green vote. The secretary will take the roll on House File 5. All senators having voted, the secretary will close the roll. There being 37 in favor and 28 opposed, the bill is passed and its title agreed to.